We're going to read now from the Word of God, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, which you'll find on page 240 of the Good News Bible, New Testament. Chapter 2 of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, page 240. The first ten verses. In the past you were spiritually dead because of your disobedience and sins. At that time you followed the world's evil way. You obeyed the ruler of the spiritual powers in space, the spirit who now controls the people who disobey God. Actually, all of us were like them and lived according to our natural desires doing whatever suited the wishes of our own bodies or minds. In our natural condition, we, like everyone else, were destined to suffer God's anger. But God's mercy is so abundant and his love for us is so great that while we were spiritually dead, in our disobedience, he brought us to life with Christ. It is by God's grace that you have been saved. In our union with Christ Jesus, he raised us up with him to rule with him in the heavenly world. He did this to demonstrate for all time to come the extraordinary greatness of his grace in the love he showed us in Christ Jesus. For it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. God has made us what we are, and in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good deeds, which he has already prepared for us to do. Let's just pray. Father, once again we have to throw ourselves on your mercy that we may not just talk together but that your Holy Spirit of truth may plant deep within our hearts some fresh seeds of faith. We want to understand tonight, Lord, more of your grace so that that very word thrills our hearts. Forgive us that it's one with which we may have become a little too familiar take us back tonight to amazing grace until it becomes a sweeter sound than ever before. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Tonight is the third of three talks that I've been giving. Number one was the greatness of God and the intellectual problems we have in getting to know him. And then the second, last Sunday evening, was the goodness of God and the moral problems we have in getting to know him. And tonight we come to the third, the grace of God and the emotional problems in getting to know him. I wonder what that word grace really says to you. What kind of feelings or thoughts come into your heart? I love the story of the archbishop who was going to stay in a vicarage And the vicar told his little daughter very sternly, now when he comes, before you say anything to him, say your grace. So when he came in, you can guess what she did. As soon as he entered the door, she said, for what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. For many, grace is simply something to say before you tuck into your baked beans. To others, it's what young ladies pick up at finishing schools in France. And to others, it's titles given to archbishops and other of their kind. But why should Christians sing about it, if that's all it means? Why is it that though the world hardly ever uses this word, Christians are constantly using it? Why is it that in so many of the hymns in the hymn book, this word grace comes? There it was, right in the first verse of our first hymn tonight. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing the triumphs of his grace. And in a moment we're going to sing the hymn that really got into the charts. Surprising, it's 
two or three hundred years old and yet it went right up into the charts amazing grace how sweet the sound it saved a wretch like me well this was a word that Christians didn't invent but they did improve it a great deal let me tell you where they picked it up and what it meant when they did and then tell you what happened to the word it began as a purely physical word it applied to people's bodies and it referred to the beauty of either the proportions of their bodies or the motions of their bodies it would be used today for example of an champion ice skater and you might still use it in that sense and say what grace there is as they glide across the ice it was a purely physical word describing beautiful proportion or motion of a human body that's where it was when Christians began to pick it up and began to use it but frankly if they'd left it there and we were saved by grace then I'm a non-starter <laughs> <laughs> and I think most of you are too if we have to be saved by the beauty of our proportions or our motions of our physical frames then those of us with flat feet and other handicaps don't stand a chance but they lifted the word and it began to be applied not to the outward beauty of the human person but to the inward beauty it was realized that beauty is more than skin deep and so when somebody had a sweet or a very kind nature someone who couldn't think a wrong thought that kind of a person they were said to be a gracious person and the word grace had moved from being an outward physical thing to an inward very personal character description but still the word went on up the ladder and it was lifted one stage higher it's interesting that it's always been a word to give pleasure it's never been a word that put people off it has always been a compliment it's always been a word that gave you a nice feeling when it was used of someone and the third step up was when it was applied not just to an individual in their physical appearance or even in their character but to the relationships that existed between two people and when it got to that level it meant that one person was being extremely generous to another the word grace then meant to give something to someone else and to give something really valuable something that would bring great joy to the person who received it a gift of grace her majesty still has a number of grace and favor houses which she gives to people rent free to live in grace becomes an act of generosity between people and then it moved further up still it's moved from the physical to the personal to the social and finally it got lifted right into the moral realm and it meant then for one person to be extremely generous to another who didn't deserve it and it even went one stage further not only someone who didn't deserve it but someone who'd done things that really made it just the opposite of deserving it now that's where the word finally got to and then it was a word that could be applied to God in Jesus Christ let me tell you two stories both of them familiar to you one is of a Borstal headmaster in the north of England who had a very difficult boy sent into his charge a boy who misbehaved a boy who smashed things up a boy who was cruel to the other boys and this headmaster tried everything with this Borstal boy that he could he tried tough treatment he tried soft treatment he tried privileges he tried everything and he could get nowhere with him until one day he called the boy into his office and said now listen I have tried to straighten your life out every way I know I can't seem to get through there is only one more thing I know that I can try and I can only do it with your permission the boy looked up a bit surprised at that he'd never been asked his permission for anything before and the headmaster said I want to bring you to live in my home I want to change your name to my name I want you to be my son and I only ask that you say yes and the boy looked at the headmaster and finally nodded his head and that actually happened and he came to live in that headmaster's home 
From then on, if the boy got into trouble, it was the headmaster's name that was dragged down. And I would be telling you a lie if I told you that he behaved like a little saint from that moment on. But it is the truth that he began to want to straighten his life out from that moment. Now the headmaster was offering that boy grace. He didn't deserve it, but he was being offered it. Now the other story is of Corrie ten Boom. Corrie ten Boom, the Dutch lady who was sent to the concentration camp for housing Jews and hiding them from the Gestapo, you know that the man who betrayed her family to the Nazis, the man who was responsible for her father's death and her brother's death and her sister's death, lay in hospital dying and Corrie ten Boom heard about it and she went to see that man to tell him of the love of Jesus. Now that is grace. It is to take a generous attitude to someone who not only does not deserve it, but someone who has done everything not to deserve it. That's grace. And it's one of the rarest and most beautiful things in the whole world. Now I think I can best illustrate what grace is by picking up one or two of the threads from the previous two talks I've given you. On the one hand, do you remember when we spoke of the greatness of God, I said that God is so great that he knows everything. You cannot teach him anything, you cannot inform him of anything. He knows everything and therefore he knows everything about me. He knows my past, he knows my present, he knows my future. He knows everything I've ever done, everything I've ever said, everything I've ever felt, everything I've ever thought. He has the whole dossier on my life. He's had to sit through the whole film of my career. He knows the lot and nobody else does. Now just ask yourself this question. Are you glad or sorry that he's the only one who knows everything about you? Would you feel that the people sitting around you now would like you better or not so much if they knew everything about you? Let that question really sink in and be answered. Here is a God who knows everything about me. I'm jolly glad you don't. And I don't think you'd like me any better if you did. How would you like to live with someone who was immediately aware of every thought you had and every feeling you had and could read you like a book the whole time? How would you feel? Would you choose to go into digs with them? I guess not. How would you think they would feel living with you if they knew everything about you immediately? It would be even more uncomfortable for them than for you. And when I told you of last week of God's amazing perfection and his reaction to anything that falls short of his own standards, how do you think it is for God to have to live with the likes of me and you? Now this is where grace came in. I would have thought that God would want to get as far away from me as possible because when I knew that he knew that much, I wanted to get as far away from him as possible. But instead of that, every talk I've given you so far is a talk about a God who not only met me halfway, but came the whole way to meet me. When we looked at the great intellectual gulf that we have to cross because God is inconceivable to our mind, I told you that in Jesus he came right to where I could understand him. He came the whole way and met me as a man in among men and I could understand. When I talked about the moral gulf there is between a holy God and sinful men, I could say yet again that, Jesus, that God did not stay on the other side of the gulf and say you try and pull your own socks up and make your way to me. But in Jesus he came all the way to my side and met me where I am. If that's not grace, what is? We're beginning to understand the grace of God when we consider his knowledge of us. But consider next his acceptance of us. 
I was reading a version of the parable of the prodigal son in which the prodigal came stumbling home along the road and the father came running to meet him and stopped a yard away and said, whatever's that smell? Pigs! You've been mixing with pigs. And how much of my money have you got left? You spend it all? Go and get a bath. And then go and work in the fields until you've paid back all that I gave you. And then you come in and I'll give you a good big hug. That was the version I read. I'm so glad it wasn't the, rev the version there is in the Bible. The Bible tells of a father who didn't say you smell of pigs nor of a father who said you spend all the money I gave you. It speaks of a father who ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. That's grace. It's of a God who accepts you as you are and where you are. And when you begin to think of that in the light of who and what he is, the word grace begins to blow up into such a concept that your heart can hardly hold it. The one who knows the worst about me has promised to stand by me. That's grace. As one writer has put it in a memorable sentence, no talebearer can inform on us now. No enemy can make an accusation stick. No forgotten skeleton can come tumbling out of some hidden closet to abash us and expose our past. No unsuspected weakness in our character can come to light to turn God away from us. Why not? Because the God who knows the worst promises to stand by. No one can ever bring anything up that will spoil that promise because God knew all about it before it was brought up. That's grace. We can go on examining this wonderful thing from so many angles. I found myself asking all sorts of questions. Here's a question for Christians among you to ask. Why me? Why me? Out of all the thousands, millions of people there are, why should God talk to me? Why should he set his hand on me and say, I want you to be my son? Why should he include me in his eternal purpose? Why me? And if I try and find the answer in me, I will never find it. I can only answer by finding something in him. In other words, he didn't choose me because he found grace in me. He chose me because I found grace in him. Why should he bother? One of the natural reactions of human nature is that the worse a person gets, the less help he gets. Myra Hindley is a good example, the girl who is in prison tonight, because she was engaged in that terrible murder of, on the moors, which Perhaps some of you don't even remember now. And the things that were done to those children before they were buried on the Yorkshire or Derbyshire moors. But Myra Hindley has found grace in the sight of God. And the public outcry when she was considered for parole was colossal. Because the normal human reaction is that the worse a person gets the less generosity there is offered to them. But when I read my Bible, I find this incredible statement that where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Or should I have done it with my hands like this? Where sin gets worse, grace gets better. As man gets lower and lower, God offers more and more grace. That is an incredible reaction. It's the very reverse of every human reaction to the response we get when we try to help someone. And it takes God to react like that. So that when this world in, at one stage in its history was filled with violence, when people were living self-centeredly entirely for the indulgence of their own physical appetites, 
when you couldn't walk the streets at night for fear of being mugged, when violence filled the earth and people had forgotten all about God, in that very situation Noah found grace in the sight of God. When the world was at its worst and about to be destroyed, the grace of God was reaching down to get hold of someone who would respond. This is grace. And it means that God trusts us as if we'd never let him down and treats us as if we were saints, not sinners, and even calls us saints. It is in a word, and a rather long word, justified. And whenever you see that word justified or justification, this is what we're thinking about. Some of you, not many, will remember that some years ago my wife and I were fairly heavily involved in a murder case the defendant stayed in our home some months and I remember the eight days we spent in the assizes and I'll never forget the moment when the jury came back after eight days and the QC had said I just don't know and the foreman was asked what is your verdict and those two words came, not guilty. That can't help but be an emotional moment. You'd have to have a heart of granite if you were unmoved by a scene like that. And to be justified, the word is taken straight from the ancient law courts and it means God says, not guilty. In the Pigeon English Bible, which was translated into Pigeon English for the inhabitants of New Guinea, they had a real problem when they came to this word justified. And so if you take that Pigeon English New Testament and look up the word, you'll find that instead of that rather long word, there is simply the phrase, God e say im all right. That's grace. God E say him, all right. To be in God's good books, you can lift up your head again. You can say, God is my friend, not my foe. And it's in this grace that people have found a new beginning. One of the bad lads who left this country and ran away to sea and became a sailor and got mixed up in smuggling and piracy and even trading in slaves, found that God said to him, not guilty. And he was so thrilled to hear those words that he had to sing about it. And he sang, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And it was John Newton who wrote that song. That sailor boy who ran away and became a very bad lad but the grace of the Lord Jesus touched his heart and the song is still being sung centuries later. Now why, when this amazing grace is offered free, there is nothing we can do to deserve it, there is nothing we can do to earn it, it is free. It is not cheap, it cost a lot, but we didn't have to pay, but it is free. Why is it then that people refuse it? Why is it that people ignore it? Why is it that people can't accept the grace of God? It's the biggest free gift that ever offered. I saw in my papers that a man was arrested by the police two, three weeks back because he was giving away ten pound notes in London. And such generosity is so unheard of and so unnatural that he was reported to the police who took him in. And he simply had come into some money and wanted to give it away. It's strange that we should be so suspicious of free things. Well, I want to deal in the rest of the sermon with the emotional problems that people have with grace. Because when grace comes to us, it isn't the intellectual barrier that stops it getting through or even the moral barrier that stops it getting through. It is the emotional barrier now that prevents the grace getting in. And there are two emotional barriers I want to deal with. On the one hand, 
there is the barrier that comes because of the presence of wrong feelings. And if there are wrong feelings present, the grace cannot get through. On the other hand, I want to speak about the absence of right feelings. People who say, I just can't understand why others get so excited about this amazing grace. I don't feel it. I don't feel amazed. We'll talk about that in a moment. First of all, then, the presence of wrong feelings. Those who can't accept this grace because there are wrong emotions in their hearts. And all of these wrong emotions are related to the word deserve. The word deserve. And there are two that I'm going to single out to illustrate how wrong emotions can block grace. One is, if you feel too good for grace, if you feel too good, sooner or later that will produce a feeling, an emotion of resentment toward God which will block grace. The other feeling I want to mention is the feeling of feeling too bad, of feeling so bad that an emotion of feeling rejected by God comes in. And whether you feel resentful toward God because you don't feel so bad, or a feeling of rejection by God because you feel too bad, these emotions get in there as wrong feelings and the grace of the Lord Jesus can't get through to the heart or touch it. Let's just look at them in a little more detail. The first emotion is feeling that I'm not quite so bad as that. You know, somebody came up to me after last Sunday evening, I know they're not here tonight, so I can say it, and they spoke to me very frankly, it was the first time they'd been here, first time I'd been able to preach to them, no, it wasn't the first time they'd been here, but the first time I'd preached. And a very honest man said to me, I listened very carefully, he said, I'll tell you quite frankly, I don't honestly feel as bad as you make me out. Now that was being very honest. Now he did in fact come from Germany. So I asked him whether he felt that the Nazis were worse people than he was. And he thought this through. And he said, well, until tonight I think I would have said so. But I'm having to think again. And he was honest enough to think it through to the point where he said, I suppose I could have got caught up in that myself. Now, I read from Miracle on the River Choir last week. I intended to bring it tonight. I've forgotten. I wanted to read you part of the description of what happened to those British officers trained in Sandhurst, most of them having had a public school education, and what happened to those men after six months in a Japanese prisoner of war camp in the Malaysian jungle, and how they would hang around the slop pails and fight and push to grab one piece of potato peel and run away into the jungle like an animal that had grabbed something. These were men from public schools, from Sandhurst. These were British officers. The truth is that if the restraints are taken off, we all slide down. If God takes the break off our life, we don't run uphill. We slide downhill. And so to those who don't feel bad enough, I say what God would say. It matters not whether you feel that you're not as bad as that. What God says is, you are and that even the best things you've done have been tainted with that self-centeredness which is your very being. This resentment towards God can come out in a number of ways. If good things happen, this person can say, well, I have lived a good life and I've deserved it. Or if bad things happen, the same feeling can come out, well, what have I done to deserve this and why should God treat me like this? As if we deserve to be looked after. I'll never forget the funniest occasion I had that put to me. A man of 96 was in hospital and I was asked to go and see him. And as I talked to him, he said, why should God let this happen to me? And I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, why should he let me come into hospital? I've tried to live a decent, upright life. I said, do you mean you've never been in the hospital? He said, never. And you're how old? 96. 
And I said, is it serious? Well, he says, they say, I've been here for about a fortnight. <laughs> and he was really resentful that after 96 years of health, he should have to spend two weeks in a hospital. Now, you may laugh, but have all of us not said, why should God let this happen to me? I don't really deserve this. I've lived a fairly decent life. That shows that we're thinking that we're too good for grace. Because, in fact, every single good thing I've done and every good thing I've received, it's all been of grace. If it's been a good day today, that's a day of grace. It's not a day of desert or merit. It's a day of grace. If I've had health for some of my life, that's been grace. It wasn't because I deserved it. It was grace that gave it to me. Are you with me? There's a whole syndrome here of what I do or do not deserve that is not the true position and it blocks grace getting in. If I start thinking of what I have deserved or haven't deserved, then immediately I'm shut off from grace because I feel too good. The elder brother in Luke 15 felt this way and it wasn't long before his goodness turned to resentment. Before he was saying to his own father, I never broke your commandments, I didn't run away and spend your money, I have not been visiting prostitutes. And the resentment that comes out cut him off from the grace of his own dad. But it's the other emotion, the other wrong emotion, which I find more common, and it's this. I feel too bad to accept grace. It's not resentment toward God that I feel, it's rejection by God that I feel. I have sunk too low, I've done too much, I am beyond redemption. Very often feelings like that make us into our own judge and unfortunately executioner. And such people need to be reminded God is your judge, not you. And very often such feelings have sprung from human experiences in which there has been a rejection in childhood or in adulthood, a feeling of being a failure, a feeler, feeling I'll never make it, which has not been produced by God, but which has been produced by people. And one of the things that we do in life, if we're not careful, is take the feelings we've received from people and transfer them to God and say, God, because people felt me about me like that, you must. And that is a deadly emotion because the grace of God cannot get through if you feel too bad. If you feel that you are a failure and always will be, then how can the grace of God get through? To both these groups there is the same answer. Both have made the same mistake. Both have started their thinking with the word deserve instead of the word grace. And they've said, do I deserve it or don't I? And one has said, I do, and one has said, I don't. And grace is neither deserved nor not deserved. Grace is free. And to both those groups, God says the same sentence, you don't deserve it, but I do give it. You don't deserve it, but I do love you. And the trouble is the first group doesn't hear the second part of the sentence, the first part of the sentence, and the second group doesn't hear the second part and their inner emotions are blocking their ears to the whole sentence. And the whole sentence is, none of you deserve it, but I love all of you. That's grace. And so it's when the word deserve begins to come in that the wrong emotions creep in, depending on whether you say yes or no to the question, do I deserve grace? The very question, do I deserve grace, is like asking, is there a square circle? Or why is an oven when it's hot? It's a nonsensical question to ask, do I deserve grace? Because it cannot be deserved and it cannot be not deserved. It is freely given. And so that's one blockage. And that's how we deal with it, by listening to God saying, you don't deserve it at all. But I give it freely because I love you. And once you've heard that whole sentence and really heard it, then the sense of resentment toward God because he did something you didn't deserve goes. Or the sense of being too far gone to receive his grace goes. And grace, amazing grace, can get right in. Finally, let me look at the other side of this emotional problem. 
the absence of right feelings. Now this is a very real problem to many people, especially in our day, and I'll tell you why in a moment. To those who want to accept grace but can't feel it. Those who hear songs like Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, and they have to say, it isn't amazing to me and it doesn't sound sweet to me and yet I'm wanting to believe it. Shouldn't I be feeling very happy about it? Shouldn't I be singing about it myself? Shouldn't I be excited and uplifted by the very word and yet somehow it is not stirring me emotionally. Now we need to recognize differences of temperament and your graph of high and low will be different from another. Some people have a graph like this and they have great highs. Uh, usually you see those in public and they have great lows and they're often in private and some of the happiest people you see in public are some of the most miserable in private. And some people's feelings are just like that, a nice steady ocean wave. Now there are differences of temperament and we must not want each other's emotional experiences and if someone else is a high-low type, well, if you want their highs, are you prepared to have their lows as well or would you rather stay with your own emotional makeup? But having said that, feelings are a vital part of life. Most of our actions are motivated by feeling. Most of our relationships are colored by what we feel about another person. And this applies to our relationship with God as much as to any other relationship. You cannot cut feelings out. Emotions do matter. And the word grace should have an emotional response in your heart. So let's look at why in our age this emotional response is difficult. And I'm going to speak very frankly here and say quite simply that our age in which we have to live is so emotionally unbalanced and unhealthy that all of us suffer from the handicap of a society in which emotions have gone haywire. And to get them rightly related to grace requires a real work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Let me spell it out. There are two things emotionally unhealthy about our society. They're not strictly confined, one to the younger people and one to the older people, though there is a general drift in that direction. On the one hand, our emotions have been exploited too much. And on the other hand, they have been expressed too little. And we are trapped between too much exploitation and too little expression. Let me tell you what I mean. First, exploitation. For the past 20 years, we have lived in a society that has seen emotions as of the essence of life. And that if we can find the right emotion, we have found life. And the search for experience which will bring that emotion has captured many of us. It is a search for some sensation, some new titillation, some new feeling that will say, now I'm really living. This is real life. Our entertainment world is geared to giving you constant doses of emotion. Our music is geared to stimulate primarily your emotion. If you want proof of that, next time there is a pop session and you're involved in any way, just ask those who've listened to a song to repeat all the words of the song. Now this has captured us from many, many angles. It has unfortunately given us the idea that a real relationship has got to be based on feelings. The over-romantic view of marriage has led directly to one marriage in three breaking down because if you marry purely on the understanding that a relationship is based on feelings, then when the feelings wear off, the marriage is worn off. Now, feelings are a vital ingredient in marriage, but they're not the essence of it. They are a byproduct of other things which are more important. And as soon as I take feelings as a byproduct and make them the essence, 
I have stepped onto an escalator that moves inevitably downhill for this reason, that if feelings are the main thrust of my existence, I find that with any drug I need a bigger and a bigger and a bigger dose to get the same sense of living. I need to move faster and faster and faster. I need music that's louder and louder and louder. And one of the most disturbing things that has happened over the last five or six years is that having explored every pleasant feeling to its utmost, ultimately putting the most intimate pleasures of life on the screen for all to see, we have now got to the point where there is the exploration of unpleasant feelings to see if that can take us further into life. And this means more and more horror and people going to the cinema to get a really good fright and what gave them a fright last week will not give them a fright next week so we must dream up something even more horrifying even more disturbing, even more shattering, so that they'll get the same amount of feeling and come back for their ticket next week. I've said enough to give you the exploitation of feeling, and this has dulled and dimmed our emotions. Now, if someone comes from that background and says, hey, do you mean that Jesus will give me the biggest trip of all? And many joined the Jesus movement because they thought that way then I tell you if you come to Jesus looking for a bigger stimulation without the quadraphonic sound and the Panasonic vision, without all that, if you're coming to Jesus and expecting grace to be the biggest trip of all, then I tell you honestly, you're going to be very disappointed. And I hope you won't think this irreverent, but I thought, I wonder how such a person would really want the hymn to be written. And I came up with this fantastic grace how great the sound I took a trip for free I once was bored I blew my mind and now I'm high on tea <laughs> now if that's the version of Christianity if that's what I'm looking for a kind of alternative trip then frankly it will not come that is an exploitation of the emotions and Christians have rightly said we are not going to try and compete with that kind of emotional stimulation to bring people to Christ for to do so would be to mislead them terribly and to make them think that once you come to Christ you live on an all-time high which beats heroin hollow now the other thing I said was that we also live in an age in which feelings are too little expressed. After all, we're British. And to show our feelings is considered rather coarse. It may be excused at a football match, but then you're carried away in the crowd. But to do it by yourself would be quite unforgivable. And it is a fact that we won't even allow bereaved people the luxury of crying. And we say, Mrs. Sonso is bearing up wonderfully. She hasn't shed, shed a tear. It has been discovered that Irish and Jewish people are far more able to bear with bereavement because they are allowed to howl and wail. And that those who think it's brave to be unemotional, to keep a stiff upper lip and not let anyone know how you really feel, that that is damaging to our emotional life. Unfortunately, this idea got right into the church. And I was brought up in an atmosphere of Christianity in which to show your feelings was really not the done thing in which love was defined as a kind of dogged determination to do good and was something quite different from feeling real affection for someone and how joy and peace were interpreted I found very difficult for these are emotions and when I turn to my Bible I find that that kind of Christianity is not to be found in the Bible I find here a very emotional book 
It doesn't major on emotions, but emotions are such a real part of life that if you read through the book of Psalms, you will cover the whole range and gamut of human emotion. If you turn to the very shortest verse in the Bible, you'll find it's only two words. It's in John chapter 13. I'm sorry, John chapter 11. And you'll find there it just says, Jesus wept. And here there is a definition given of such things as love, joy and peace which have a very definite emotional content. So here we are trapped in an age in which some people's emotions have been exploited too much and others have been expressed too little and in this situation, in this context, we sing amazing grace and the emotional blockage is that I can't feel it. How am I going to get over that one? Let me try and tell you. It involves a twofold work of the Holy Spirit. Number one, in reversing the flow of your feelings, in reversing the flow. And second, in releasing that flow. By reversing the flow I mean this. Most of our feelings today come from the outside in. Something stimulates us through our body and our mind and might reach our spirits in that way, but often that's where the stimulation comes. And even Christians can get their emotions that way by going to a big exciting meeting, which by its very atmosphere, which by everything in it, stimulates them from the outside and the feelings start through the body, go through the mind and into the spirit. And I just want to tell you that the Holy Spirit wants to reverse that flow so that the feelings come from the spirit through the mind into the body. That's what I mean by reversing the flow. Otherwise, if you were sent to prison for your faith tomorrow, you'd have to leave all your feelings at Millmead. And when Paul and Silas were thrown into jail, they were in a stinking rat-infested jail in the Middle East at midnight with no light at all. And what were they doing? Having a sing-song. And the reason was that the emotions were not coming from the outside in, but from the inside out. The Holy Spirit had reversed the flow of their emotions. They started in the middle and they came out. Whereas so often we look for situations, circumstances, experiences outside us from which we will get feelings. If you came here tonight hoping that that would happen to you, then I plead with you, let the Holy Spirit do something quite different and let him start right inside your spirit and say, in your spirit, God loves you just as you are. And let that come out. Then you'll sing Amazing Grace properly. The other side to it is, of course, and by the way, when the Holy Spirit plants feelings within, they may not be as exuberant, as exciting as the feelings apparently expressed at the local disco. But I'll tell you this, they don't wear off and they don't wear thin. They may be much calmer than the world's stimulation, they may be much quieter. The same man who wrote Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, wrote another, How Sweet the sound, Name of Jesus Sounds in a Believer's Ear. Soothes his sorrow heals his wounds, drives away his fear. What's the next line? It makes the wounded spirit whole, it calms the troubled breast. Now do you notice all those words? Soothes, calms. This isn't, hey, let it rip. I'm high. That kind of language doesn't come in. It's how sweet the sound, it soothes the troubled soul, it calms. And perhaps in all the noise and excitement of our world, one of the emotions which people are missing most is the emotion of peace. A deep inner feeling of serenity, which in one sense is far more exciting than, wasn't it great tonight? But to go home and tomorrow morning to know a deep inner emotion of peace, and a joy that is far, far deeper than pleasure or even happiness. And a love that can feel affection for people you wouldn't like. They may not be as spectacular as the excitement the world offers on the wide screen. 
but these are the real emotions that come from inside. These need to be released in the Holy Spirit. I've noticed again and again that the Holy Spirit is very often likened to alcohol. And one of the things that alcohol does, and the reason why it's dished out very early at cocktail parties, is precisely to release your emotions. When you're all tied up and you're imitating the wallpaper in one corner, <laughs> have a sherry that'll take away your inhibitions. That's why on the day of Pentecost they said these people are drunk. Listen to them. They're letting it out. And Peter said, no, they're not. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. The pubs aren't open yet. And Paul writes in Ephesians 5, the same letter that I read earlier about grace. Don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. Let it out. You can divide Christian music very quickly into two situations. There is the, the music that is used simply to stimulate people from the outside. Jesus Christ Superstar has stimulated thousands of people from the outside. I don't know one person it's led to Christ. A football crowd can sing Abide With Me, 70,000 men singing Abide With Me. It's stimulation from the outside. Even Handel's Messiah can be used to stimulate from the outside. And I've been to a concert of Handel's Messiah and heard people coming out who showed no trace whatever in their conversation of any sense of the presence of the Lord and yet saying, wasn't it marvelous? Didn't they do the Hallelujah Chorus well? And singing Jerusalem at the Women's Institute, all these things are stimulating from the outside. But I can tell you this, that Handel wrote Messiah because he was stimulated from the inside. Because he went to church and he heard a preacher preach about the Messiah. And Handel sat there and took notes and wrote down every piece of scripture that preacher referred to. And he came home from that church with those scriptures in his head. And he went through them and he got the whole picture of the Messiah. And within three weeks that glorious music had come. It had come from his spirit from the inside out. And Abide With Me came in the same way. And so whenever we stand to sing a hymn, as we're going to in a moment, and we're going to sing Amazing Grace, either that is external stimulation, titivating you in some religious way, and it will wear off by the time you get home tonight, or else it is an expression of something the Holy Spirit has put deep within you. God loves me, though I don't deserve it. He knows the worst about me, but he's promised to stand by me. Nobody can bring up anything from my past that will affect my relationship to God because God knew it before it came up. Amazing grace. It's interesting that grace and emotion usually meet in music. And God gave us this talent of music and it's been used in Christian worship and the Bible is full of music simply because music is an expression of the emotions if you're going to cut out emotions from the biblical message, you'll have to cut out all the music that's mentioned. But it's music that comes from the reversed flow. It's music that comes from the inside out. It's not music that's being forced from the outside in. That's why I always feel a bit uncomfortable if I sense I'm being a bit of a cheerleader. Do you know what I mean? A kind of red coat Butlin's preacher saying, come on, let's have a good time singing. Let's work it up, brothers. No, let's let it out, brothers, if it's there. Let's sing Amazing Grace. And as I've talked, if your spirit has been saying, Lord, I never realized just what an amazing thing grace was. I've never fully understood, but tonight I know that I'm saved by grace. I didn't deserve it, but you gave it because you loved me as I was. Let's sing that right now. <laughs> 